Hello everyone, this is Bryant from Technology with Bryant. In this video, you'll see how to improve onboarding experience at your company. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thanks for watching and let's get started. So imagine yourself as a first time new employee, whether you're a fresh new graduate from university or a professional engineer with years of experience. You're excited and ready to kickstart your career at a new place. You're eager to learn, eager to deliver, and ready to show why you're capable. But as you start your first day, things don't look quite right. You still didn't get your laptop and equipment and heard it may take another week or more to get it. You don't have access to your email, and the HR staff and manager you talk for the first time are not available. And making things even worse, you have no idea who your teammates are. You wait a few more days to see if things get better. By the end of the onboarding week, you finally got your email access. But when you check your email inbox, there is a practically nothing. However, as a proactive employee you are, you decide to read documentation and network with the people. When you finally search through an internal portal, you get some documentation and all the presentation slides, but they look quite outdated. And it looks as if you need to request other permissions to assess few environment. You search through an organization chart to locate few coworkers. When you reach them out though, you get a cold response and everyone is now willing to help. After a month passed by, you finally get access to most environments, but you're pretty much frustrated and lost the motivation at this point. A normal build process takes more than a day to build and a month to get delivered to the actual production environment. And this is if you get lucky. There are just too many manual processes too much approval processes and lack of a resource to automate. You finally discover that every other engineer just decide to live with it. And you feel as if something has to change. This was not exactly what you expected when you joined this team. And it looks as you just have two options. Become like everyone else and change yourself to learn to live like that in a toxic environment. Or do something about it to change the entire team. Maybe this was a very extreme one-ended example of a terrible onboarding process that would give a goosebump for everyone. Surprisingly, this is quite a possible situation and I've seen, heard, and even experienced similar type of environment and culture for my more than a decade of experience working with different companies in the past. Good onboarding experience is nothing to be ignorant about as it sets the entire culture and overall working environment for a long extended period of time. Let's look at what good onboarding process actually means for the team and the company. Here are some reasons why a good onboarding process is needed. It caused frustration for new employees. When somebody joins your team, we should have put in his or her shoes to feel what it's like. After all, everyone started as a newly hired employee at some point. You never know. Maybe he or she will bring such innovative idea and have potential to become rock star engineer or a tech lead in your team. But when one feels as if everything is lagging and not able to deliver anything, this will destroy the morale of the person. That constantly leads to few more outcomes. This will affect the team culture. A good way to look at a team is by looking at its culture. Team consists of employees and they together are ones who will deliver the business value for the company. Even if a good employee joins the company, if it's impossible to change the culture because it's already toxic, either he or she will leave or eventually give up and just 
observe that part of it is toxic culture. And this means that overall throughput expected to be delivered from the team will get affected. Even if a team manager expected 90% to 100% OKR, that is objective and key result, for this quarter, the actual delivery might be like 70% or even 50% or less because team is not motivated enough and cannot do the jobs effectively enough. Lastly, all of this eventually lead down to hurt the business value. Since a team cannot effectively deliver, this get reflected in the comp company's overall vision and target. And this is what ultimately matters at the end. So who am I? Why am I here to talk about this? These are a few things I have done in the past. I will not go through each one, but as you can see, you kind of can sense that I'm really passionate about helping to create a happy culture and the care about onboarding. So these are a few high level items we'll go through. First two points are pretty simple enough, where we we'll spend a lot of time on the third point. First one is measure time and reduce the duration of time and assess the factors to onboard new employees. There's a famous book called The Art of War, which is one of the famous business books, though it was written like a thousand years ago. In this book, this is probably the most well-known quote, which goes like this. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Basically, before doing anything, we need to know what is the problem. This is how a typical ineffective onboarding process looks like. It usually takes more than three weeks to just to set up all the environment necessary for employees to get started. Nothing really get initiated or set up till new employee's first day. By the end of his or her first week, new employee is still not sure whom to talk to because everyone is working in silo and few documentation are found. Week two and week three are going by. Few more things still need to get approved and he or she is not clear what he, he or she needs to work on. Although this looks surprising, I have seen and experienced this is quite a common scenario for some teams. Then let's look at what an effective onboarding process may look like. I've experienced that a typical onboarding process may take less than a week, but definitely do not go over two weeks. Most basic accounts get initiated even before a new employee joins a team. So he or she joins a team, everything is just like walk in the park. The employee get amazed by how much power he or she has and be excited what to deliver. He or she is provided with the sufficient instruction on what to set up, what to read, how and how to network. And there's a mentor or an onboarding buddy who is willing to help out. By week one, everything should be available and this employee already made himself or herself at home. By week two or three, he or she will make the first commit to the repository, busy enough to attend enough agile meetings or pursue on learnings on his or her own. This new employee finally feels at home and excited that everyone else around is a superstar. To improve the process overall, we need to find out at which stage takes along and between which process it is manual. For example, if you look at this hypothetical example, you can see each approval process takes at least a day, and there are a lot of manual processes. The total time takes over four days, which is quite long. 
we can possibly identify opportunities to improve this process and shrink the approval process by automating few steps. We've learned how to identify bottlenecks. Let's move on to the next topic, which is to provide a rock solid documentation. We need to look at this from both top-down angle as well as bottom-up perspective. So if you look at top-down, this is a way to organize the contents and introduce structure around what will be given to new employees. Content have to be tested out and make sense. And bottom-up means sufficient contents. Without contents, there's nothing going to offer it. Eventually, they have to converge together. First, let's try to see how we can best achieve top-down approach. There are different tools we can utilize for this. And this can be simple as just a table of contents or list of items written down on a paper. Or we can leverage a tool built inside a GitHub. In this example, we have a GitHub issue that is assigned to a new employee. We can create a GitHub issue like this that lists out what to focus on during his or her first week. This feels welcoming and gives a simple yet great way for new employee to pursue on learning. In addition, we can also provide guides for the constant weeks. A good tool to leverage is GitHub Project Board. We can organize the tasks to do and break down by week by week basis. Good thing is that we can automate the creation of issues and project board using tools like GitHub Actions and REST APIs. But after we build all of this, we should make sure to test this with the group of people to see if it makes a sense. One of the must requirement for any doc is that since it can be outdated, the consistent effort is needed to maintain the documentation. After these guidelines are created and given out, the employee might still have few questions. So always point them to open channels like Slack chat where they can reach out to others for help and possibly assign a mentor or an onboarding buddy where they can freely reach out to others for help. We create the guidelines for the employees to follow, but this is not possible without contents. Whether it is documentation, a tutorial video, or interactive materials, we need to provide the contents that need to be linked. There are essentially two types of content. We need one for general, which is accessible for anyone. Since this is open to anyone, it is the best to utilize some type of content management system where no coding skill is required to change the content. Few tools that we can leverage are Git, GitHub Wiki, or Project Board linked with the different issues. But for a deeper dive into technical topics, this documentation can exist within GitHub as a form of markdown files. For a general documentation, it is again best to utilize a CMS content management system where anyone with authentication can log in to change the contents. The information can be about general resource, roadmap, or etc. For technical documentation, this should reside in GitHub repository. Anyone who knows Git can create markdown files to provide instructions. And code syntax, highlight, links, and basic text formatting is supported. One can easily create a prettier page using GitHub pages, which is pretty nice. Moving on, this is a topic which I want to put most emphasis on. It is about how to transform a culture. Changing a culture is easily the most difficult part of any process, but it is not impossible. So why does it matter? If you're a manager, you like to achieve XXX goal or target. 
but simply adding or hires more members to the team does not always increase the total outcome. In fact, it can actually reduce the total throughput by making things more complex and everyone feeling lost. So why does this happen? This can happen because everyone is not performing at the maximum capacity. And the main reason has to do with the culture. So let's say you realize a change is needed, but any change is hard, especially if it involves a large group of people. It is a natural behavior for people to resist the changes. To change, two conditions have to be met. First, before anything else, a realistic goal has to be set. If the goal is not possible to achieve or simply not right, it is not worthwhile to even try. Once that is clear, we can try to move to actual first step. We can approach this in incremental steps. Let's see what happens when we actually try to implement a change. A leader maybe has a vision and want to introduce a change. When he or she pitches an idea, majority will not want to change. Likely, what will happen is that only few people will listen and want to take active roles in it. Others will listen but will not comply until things are actually implemented and easy to follow. Finally, there will be a group of people who simply resist to change till it becomes official and become mandatory. So how do we actually go about changing it? From my experience, what works best is by building small wins first. We can then try to evangelize and repeat process over and over. We can build a small winning case first, present the result to the team. When we do this first time, only few people will follow that. But we can then work with these people to spread our changes further. We can repeat these steps till the majority adopt the change. Lastly, we can talk with the manager or higher up to make this a mandatory process. One of the dilemma though is how to make the employees to become more proactive and take actions. Basically, how do you make people to become mentors? Or even better, how do you turn them into leaders? There are two ways to do it, and it is best to implement both ways. First is by hiring the right people. By bringing the right talent, one can bring the fresh new idea and new life to the team. But if not being careful, it can go other way around, which is either destroying the team or the new person becomes a part of his toxic culture. But you might be interested in another way, which weighs around changing the existing team. So let's look at that. Here are three ways to transform a team. First way is to recognize and reward. We can recognize and reward an excellent employee and top contributors. We can strive to create a culture that is open and transparent. Lastly, as a team, it is important to celebrate often and welcome them as a part of the family. Here are a few ideas to recognize employee. Tools cannot solve all the problems, but they can help to enable transparency and openness better than before if they're leveraged well. Let's look at some of the tools we can leverage to create transparency. A team can use GitHub discussions, which is built like Q&A to let employees ask questions and get answers. GitHub issues also provide similar functionality. To manage project tasks, GitHub has a project board. A recently released GitHub project, which is in beta, really has a nice interface where you can categorize tasks and offers the pretty offers a pretty intuitive interface. Again, 
celebrate often. Try to create a happy cultural environment where everyone feels as they are part of a family. Although there can be so many ways to create a happy environment for everyone, it is especially hard during this COVID-19 period, where everyone is working remotely and hard to do things in a normal way. However, team can still create a happy culture by practicing few things. It's nice to have a branding for a team, and employees can have something to call them as well, like hovers, Googlers, etc. And to make meetings more interactive, there are some virtual tools like GatherTown and Sparkle. GitHub once hosted a very interesting internal conference called GitHub Summit using Sparkle platform. Lastly, employees feel really appreciated to receive surprising gifts and thank you letters from their teams or company. This will be a nice way to show as company really cares about the employees. Last topic I want to leave with is how to create a DevOps environment where everything operates smoothly and fast. While I will not go too much deep into the topic, because this is an entirely different topic of its own, I want to just give a slight preview. At the very minimum, the team should have separate the stages. For example, there are local environments, but also dev, UAT or test, and production environment. By separating stages, it's possible to minimize the potential disruption. Once that is achieved, each environment should be very closely mimicking each other. For example, data and configuration for dev and production should be pretty much the same. And for local, dev, UAT, and production, there should be different priorities. Let's look at them in our next slides. What do I mean by separating stages? Here's a diagram that gives a very general idea looking from 25,000 feet. We have local workspaces where each employee gets own testable environment. On a remote server, there's a UAT, dev, and production with a separate database, storage, etc. Once the stages are separated, there should be some periodical syncing across the environments. I've seen a situation where dev, UAT, and production are too different. When something fails during production, that could not be easily duplicated in dev due to missing database tables and fields that only exist in production. Thus, periodical downstream sync synchronization should be also practiced. And the team should have a well-designed Git operation process. Here is an example using Git flow pattern, which is most common of managing a Git within a team. As you can see, each environment should have a different focus and practice. For local environment, this is essentially your environment, so you can do anything. However, tech lead or an architect should provide documentation and set up step how to make the consistent setup for all employees. In this way, we can avoid it works on my machine and I don't know why it does not work on your machine Way, which is kind of terrible. For app, application development, and deployment, it is a good idea to deploy this application to container or Kubernetes environment. And it's possible to ship through container as well. For dev environment, there are some process that should focus on. Replicate the configuration and environment testing from higher environments. Focus on being flexible enough to deploy without a need for approval. Only deploy through pipeline process instead of a manual deployment. Encourage code review process before merging. Create multiple dev environment, dev1, dev2, etc. to be flexible enough. Here is an example of process that should focus on for UAT, test, or QA environment. This is to minimize feature changes, but stabilize. Split from a stable dev branch. Only allow changes through hotfix or major bug fix. 
Separate tasks, UAT, QA, and staging environment if the team wants to be further flexible. Lastly, but not least, most important one is production. This is to focus on learning 24 hours, 365 days. Split from stable staging or testing branch. Schedule deployment time. Only allow hotfix changes. And is critical to the backup and restore procedure. That's it. I hope you like watching this video and be sure to like it. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more interesting update and content on covering technologies like cloud, DevOps, coding, programming, etc. Thanks for watching again and hope you see you next time. Bye bye.